What is up, everybody? This is the Wild Nutrition Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Heskett, and this is episode 88. We are creeping closer to episode 100. It's wild to say that. Um, it's Podcasting has been super fun, so something that I'm very passionate about and I really like doing. So it's it's cool to see like the 100th episode coming up. Pretty soon, pretty soon. Um, is it within the year? It might be within the year. I have to make that happen. But with that being said, today's episode is another solo episode. Guest is coming. I know I've been saying it the past couple of years, but we do have a guest this upcoming week. Um, I've been holding out because she's a member of the LWA team. I wanted the LWA team to be podcast guests before I started scheduling other guests. I am starting to slowly schedule more guests. But starting next week, we will have guests back on the podcast. Anyways, hunting season's officially kicked off for me. So today's episode is a little bit about hunting, a little bit about other stuff. So the overall title today is something I posted about on social media. That that's how indecision and kind of having one foot out the door is leading to you having missed opportunities and missing your goals. That's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So, and that relates to my hunting story this past weekend. But if you're new to the channel and you're not a hunter, you didn't find me through some of my hunting content. Guess what? I'm a very avid hunter. So let's get into, I do this every year, remind people of why, kind of how I got into hunting. And then we're going to get into the actual story. So if you're not a hunter, bear with me. We got a story with a lesson later on. But let's get into the actual reason why I hunt, because I think this is appropriate before I start getting a bunch of guests and you start seeing a bunch of other hunting content on my social media channel, why I talk about this. And I might do an unapologetic Friday on it. Depends how revved up and amped up I am about hunting this year. Usually New Jersey next door to us in PA pisses me off in some way, shape or fashion about hunting. So we might have an episode. Because their hunting laws are like the black bear one a couple years ago is just, was just stupid. But so if you're you don't know you don't know my story. I didn't grow up hunting. It's something I, I grew up. I grew up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, pretty rural. Everybody hunted except me, basically. Uh, but my dad did not hunt. My mom didn't hunt. There, uh, my dad has people in his family who hunts, but. Neither of them really grew up hunting. So I grew up around a ton of hunters. I just personally did not hunt. But it's one of those things I was always really curious about, especially because I like sourcing a lot of my own food. I grow my own food. And, you know, we did that a lot growing up as well. Like we grew a lot of food or we try to source from farmer's market, um, from smaller growers, etc. So sourcing our own stuff was important so something i was really interested in but i, I never really got into it because it's a lot if you don't have a mentor if hunting something you've been considering and you're like i really want to get into it it's not easy as an adult because a lot of times as kids you're mentored by someone who was a experienced hunter they told you what you needed what you didn't needed what to listen to what is bullshit or you know, just help you get the ropes because it can also be expensive getting started too. Um, but to get started, um, it, it was just one of those things I was really interested in. Fast forward a little bit longer and my wife and I are dating and we're, we're serious. I'm not sure if we're engaged at this time or not. We work, If we're not engaged but at this time, we are damn fucking close to being engaged so we are we are in a very serious relationship but i think we're actually engaged at this part of the story so what girl very serious girlfriend slash fiance and if my wife listens to this i don't think she actually listens to my podcast but if she does i will get an angry message be like what the fuck you don't remember so she all of a sudden develops uh so loves red meat but the thing that by my wife you need to know other than i've talked about a couple times she has pcos and hypothyroidism um she also tends to be very low on iron and she tends to be low on b12 but she has a past history of a eating disorder and that eating disorder has disrupted her digestive system so taking iron pills is out of the equation so how she got iron and a lot of b12 in was red meat 
early on when we were dating, we had burgers and we had steaks quite often um, j- because she needed it. And, and we, s- we still have red meat quite often for venison. But it was essential that she needed that. She didn't feel like herself if she didn't. So we ate that a couple times a week. Then all of a sudden, one day she starts like getting nauseous with beef. And that slowly gets worse and worse and worse to the point where it is a full-blown allergy to beef where she is, well, I don't know what the actual diagnosis of an allergy, but she is doubled over, over the toilet, puking like it was, like she drank too much alcohol. Like she is violently throwing it up. Her body is rejecting it. Beef. So at that point, we have a couple decisions to make is... Well, she can't have that because that will cause more issues, obviously. But we can either try to buy bison all the time, which we're buying red meat, but we're usually buying it on sale. So we can't afford bison all the time because we would be buying steaks either as a treat or when they were under like $10 a pound. Again, this is back before 2020. We're going back 2016 to 2018 time frame, somewhere around there. Yeah, 20, 2016 to 2018. I think I got into hunting in 2018. I think. Was that when 2018? Maybe it was 2019 I got into hunting. Anyways, it's around that time frame. Somewhere between 2016. The allergies started developing in 2018, 2019. That kind of time frame. So, um, her family is an avid hunter. Her granddad had the state record in Pennsylvania for the biggest black bear for a little while. And thing is massive they actually didn't have a mount big enough to put put it on so the massive bear that is in her uncle-in-laws is actually small and the thing is massive so it's actually not the true size of the bear because they didn't have a mount that was big enough to support it so yeah there's that so she, she already knew she liked venison we couldn't afford to have bison all the time couldn't do beef so I decided to make the decision, like, your family hunts, We kind of, there's a spots in Gettysburg, I'm going to take up hunting. And my buddy at the gym I was working at, still friends with him to this day, he was like, I also, you know, I'm trying to get into hunting more. Like, he already had been hunting, just hasn't harvested anything at that time. So we're like, okay, let, let's do this thing. So I go, decide going all in on hunting because my wife just, we need to get this food for her to be healthy. Um, B12 and then the iron thing just, again, I, like I said earlier, she had an issue with an eating disorder. So iron just messed up her digestive system. And we tried the best quality, easy on the digestive system type of iron supplements before doing any of this. We tried it. didn't work. So then we're... Like the other solution would be like she has to go and get infusions and that's just unrealistic. She's a nurse. I was working as a trainer at the time. Like our schedules are crazy hectic. Like, okay, now you need like to schedule all these like infusions to go and get and just not worth it. Not realistic with our work schedules. Like you have to work like health's important, but you also have to work. Otherwise, like there's no money to pay for things. And that's an issue. So my decision was I'm going to hunt. I'm going to provide the meat for her. And that's where the whole thing happened. And the first deer I shot was the last, like the last hour of the last day of Pennsylvania rifle season. Like went through the entire fucking season, not having any success. And then it was the very last day last chance and when you're doing this like i'm doing this to provide for my wife so i'm getting, having all these thoughts like oh my god i'm terrible that i suck at hunting i'm not gonna be able to provide for her what the fuck are we gonna do and literally like three doe pop out there's one that like half year old it's basically a baby that popped out did not shoot it going ahead and then two mature does and one was perfectly broadside, and I remember I was uh, knelt down, rest of the gun, aimed, fired, and I saw it like drop down a little bit and take off. I knew I hit it, and it was like I, dumb. I just ran right over, like, "Oh my god, I got it!" Like you're supposed to wait, you're supposed to wait, even if you got. It. But I ran over, and there it was, and ended up. 
it was a heart shot that I hit. So, I, you know, not to be too graphic, but it, it there wasn't much heart left uh, when I decided to do the um, when I went through and started processing it. So, processed it myself, and at that time, I was like, "This is what I'm doing forever and ever." So, one doe that year, and then since then, many, many more deer. So. Let's get into now. That's the story. So that was the first 10 minutes of the episode. So indecision leading to you not reaching your goals. What we're actually supposed to fucking talk about today. So this weekend, um, I know there's this massive buck down where I'm hunting here um, at home. So I'm chasing this buck and I'm like, I know this guy's out here. And go out, and most of the time, I the first day I hunt every single year, I don't see shit here. Like, I'm going to go out and do it just to do it, but usually I don't see anything. So I go out in the morning, but we set up a new blind. So I, we set up this blind for my wife, who because she has to, she's pumping. But if she wants to go out, I'm like, this would be the best thing to do. Even though your pumping is going to hold some of the sound in, and they're used to sound because the road's not too far. We have mushroom houses close by. Um, where they're very active, so they're used to sound. So if you have to pump, like it's not the biggest of deals, and it, we're in a suburban area, so they're used to humans being around. So as long as the winds are right, you might be okay. So I set this blind up, but then I realized, like for a morning hunt, it's really easy to get in there. So the stand that's 15 yards in front of it to get to that stand. So this is up on a little bit of ridge. We have to walk down and walk through the woods and then get up. I'm like, we can make a lot less noise to get into the blind. And we're only 15 yards back from that. That's not too bad. We still have the shot. So instead of like a, what would be a very close shot for the other stand, it's, you know, further back with the blind, but it's still like a good shot. So I get in, uh, the, in the morning, I'm like not expecting anything. And you're waiting and waiting, and it's pitch dark. I'm like, I'm not turning on my phone. I'm not spooking anything because we're low on venison right now. I think we have four pounds of ground left, and we have some heart. And I think that's really it. So we are low as fuck right now. There's not much. And we're, we already have plans. We're going to use up at least two pounds, maybe three of the four pounds on Friday. So there's a good chance we're going to be out unless I – get this buck this upcoming weekend which i'm gonna go back out and try to chase him as long as schedules allow so if if you're not familiar with hunting there's something called legal light where you're legally allowed to shoot and honestly like legal lights sometimes it's way it's still like too dark so it's like your first opportunity when it's legal to shoot anything um, sometimes it's light enough that you can see things. Other times it's not light, just to pay. If you're in an open field, like a farm field, it's light enough to see things. If you're in the woods, which this, the blind is in the woods, uh, it is still too fucking dark. So we had cloud cover cover. It is in the woods. It is dark. And all of a sudden I see this shape and it like freaks you the fuck out. Cause you kind of see like sometimes like a raccoon or a fox move around. Like, if you've seen, like, the Skinwalker videos, like, you all of a sudden this thing is moving around. You, I'm like, that's fucking Slenderman over there. Because it's a good-sized buck just moved. I'm like, what the fuck? Usually I don't see anything this early. So Legal Light, I think, was, like, 6.30. So this popped out at, like, 6.15. And all of a sudden I realized, I'm like, that's the fucking buck. That's the buck I've been chasing. It's right in front of me. I'm like, we have to wait 15 fucking minutes before I can even see anything. I'm like hoping he's staying, hoping he's seeing. He walks off. I'm like, oh, God damn it. So 15 minutes go by. I'm like, okay, maybe I call out a little bit. So I use the grunt call. So I try to call it back. I'm like, but early season. So I just do some light grunts. And I'm not expecting much. The next thing I do, no, I look over and I can just see his outline of this one window. I'm like, holy shit, there he is. There he is. So I decided I'm going to draw back, slowly draw back. He doesn't see me. He doesn't even know I'm there. I'm like, this is perfect. They over, they're not even suspecting anything out of this blind right now. And for a mature buck, like, okay, this is great. Pull back in. I can't see the peep. And if you're not familiar with how way compound bow works, so you have your sight in front with your pins on it, and you set your pins for a certain distance. It's like 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards. That's what my default pins are. So if anything's like... 20 yards and in, I use that pin, put that on. But 
all back on the string, you have something called a peep, and that's this little hole you look through, and you're going to line that up with with your eye, looks through the peep, and you line that up with the sight in front. And there's a few other steps to this where you have to line other things up and make sure everything's okay and perfect for, to make the shot, but essentially to keep things simple so you can visualize it. So you look through this little tiny ass hole. Well, I set up, I'm like, I have this little thing that comes right to the corner of your lip to make sure like that's also in alignment. I do that. I'm like, I can't see my fucking peep. I can't see out. There's not enough light to see out. Now I'm also in a blind. So a blind's essentially like a hunting tent. So that's, it's black inside. So I'm also not getting as much light in as that is possible because I'm in a blind, not a stand. So could I have seen him in the stand? This time it's like 635. So it's definitely legal, legal light. First light, like just opened up. Like, fuck. He's like right by the other stand. Now, if I was in that stand, probably would have spooked him. So silver lining. And I'm like, should I have been there? I'm like, no, no way. I would have totally spook, spooked him. He probably would have caught wind of me at some point. So no, this is, this was the best thing to happen. I was hunting from this blind. But he's there. I can just see the outline right behind his shoulder. So, like, perfect shot to get a double lung or a heart shot. But I'm like, can't see through the peep. So, I have to wait. And then, see him move off. Now, it's just getting light enough. But he's, like, all I see is, like, his tail. Like, the his butt. That's all I see. I'm like, fuck, I can't get a shot off. And ultimately, like, he walks off. And then I see him way off in the distance, like 60 yards. Like, even if I was in the other stand, I'm like in the woods. Like, I'm not super comfortable making that shot. Maybe I would have had a shot, but probably would have spotted me. And I would have have spooked him and he would have been gone for the next, like, month. So he's gone. Like, fuck. Okay, saw him. Couldn't get a size of his antlers. Like, he was just far enough away, like, at all times, like I could never, it was either too dark when he was right in front of me, like literally 15 yards away, like easy fucking shot. It was too dark to see how many, how many points he had and how big his antlers were. But I could tell, like, I could just see the outline, like they're good size. Like, I'm like, that's the guy I've been chasing. He's big, but also I'm like, never really confirmed. Cause it was always just too dark to really see. Anyways, don't see anything the rest of the morning. Like, okay, fuck it. Um, come home, get dinner ready. They go back out. So the evening stand is a two-man stand. So I, I climb up into my, my... I'm no longer in a blind. I'm in a hunting stand. And it's only... Uh, I think it's 30, 40 yards away from where the other stand and blind are. It's about probably 50 yards from the blind. But it's not that far away, but... One side is more like bedding area, which is better for the hunting in the morning. This area is a little kill plot area, which is better for the evening. Um, just the way you pattern deer and the way I've patterned deer, that's how they react in this area is this area is better. So if you don't know what a kill plot is, essentially like I grow crops to bring deer in and they munch on stuff, but there's not enough to keep them there. They basically, there's an ag field right on the other side so they literally just like stop there munch a little bit waiting for things to get a little bit darker and then they go out to the fields where they really go to town and eat for one their um they eat i think it's six times per day I, I forget how many feeds they actually do per day um but one of them is that last which is why you usually see them like an hour 30 minutes before dark is they're getting that last one of their feeds in um, so right, so I have this little plot of, of rye grain grass. Yeah. Winter wat, rye and I put some clover and chicory in there, but that'll be up next year. But the rye's done really well. So they're in there. I can tell from tracks. I see sign that they're in there and that I can just see the section that have been eaten down, um, that they've been there. So I'm like, okay, cool. We might see something. So waiting, waiting. I do a few calls here and there, like every 30 ish, 15, 30 minutes. Nothing much, um, but not seeing much. And finally, like, I'm like, okay, usually magic hours that last hour. Like, we're still a little ways away from I'm going to relax. And as I lean back, all of a sudden I 
see a flick of an ear and flick of a tail. I'm like, what? That That's a deer there. And sure enough, 40 yards away, because that's sighted in, there's a, a deer. And I'm like, oh, shit. Okay, just relax. I have to sit up a, just a little bit, because this blind's really fucking uncomfortable. With sin, this is what I get for the cheap Walmart special for blind. I'm like, oh, perfect. It wasn't too good to be true. Well, sort of. It's just really uncomfortable sitting. I'm like, I was actually sore this morning from sitting in it. <laughs> like, it, where the, the backrest is, it's like right on my, my bottom ribs. So even though there's a little foam pad there, like, it's fucking uncomfortable. So I'm like, okay, there's a deer there. So I, I slowly sit up and he. He's looking like I see that there's there's an antler. I'm like, shit, okay. But it looks like it's a fork. So what for is like a two pointer if you're not familiar with hunting. And here in Pennsylvania, where I hunt, it needs to be a three on one side. So three points on one side is a legal buck. So I'm like, okay, it's not the big guy. It's not. I'm like, am I actually going to hunt this guy? Am, am I going to do it? I know there's a bigger guy, but first, first thing I, that's most important. So when I'm hunting, it's to fill the freezer first, get trophies second. So the goal is to fill freezer. So I have to keep that in mind. So I'm like, do I do it? Do I not? Do I wait? Cause at the, uh, this was about five, six o'clock, I think. It really blurs together. Um, yeah, it was about six. So I had like a full hour. And usually like um, last night was 7.15. So it's like I still had plenty of time. So I had six. This guy walked out like, okay. So usually I like the last half an hour is the best when I usually see the most deer. So I'm like, okay, still have time. But I'm like, am I hunting? So he ends up not walking out there. He walks away. So I sent out a little call. I'm like, maybe he'll come back. Maybe not. I, I didn't really get a good look at him, but maybe he has buddies that will come out with him. I don't know. We'll see. Let's see. Are they... So he walks out. Not a fork. He has one antler and four points. I'm like, fuck. It's actually a decent size. But he's kind of like seeing, like he's kind of sees like I'm up in the stand, but I'm not moving. So he sees something's up. But he's not too concerned, but he's still like, eh, something's going on over there. Like, am I hunt am, am I gonna burn my buck tag on him? Cause in PA you get one buck tag. So you get one buck per year. And my wife has a tag, so she can go after the other guy. But I'm like, oh, am I gonna burn my buck tag on this guy? Like, uh, oh, he's okay body size, not amazing, but it, like that would definitely fill the freezer. I'm like having all these thoughts in the back of my head, like the equivalent of like a really nice sized doe. So that's a good amount of meat. Like that would get us through October easy. And if we don't get any other deer, so hmm, should I, should I not? Should I, should I not? It's not the other guy that I really want, but it fills the freezer this weekend. And then we don't have to worry about meat. So these thoughts are all going through my head. He steps out and he starts eat munching, but he's in a position. So he didn't come any closer. And this is what I saw in the field where they, they've been eating. They're right on the edge. They haven't fully committed to going through the field yet. So they're eating their way through. I'm like, okay, so in a couple of weeks, they're going to eat that down of ground. Then they're going to have to come into the field a little bit more to get any of the food. And which gives better opportunity for me to, uh, you know, get a really good shot off. So where he's at, there's a this all this uh, thorny, viney mess that I couldn't clean up, the, like in the middle of everything. So if he takes a few more steps, I won't have a shot. So I finally make a decision. I'm like, you know what? I have to fill the freezer. My wife can go after the other guy. She has her buck tag. So I'm just going to take the shot. Now, I, saw, I know the tree he stepped out at was 25 yards. But he stepped away from me. Um, the other marker is like the 40-yard mark. So I don't really have a good, too good of a gauge. But instead of actually focusing on where he was, I'm going through my head. Should I shoot? Should I not? Should I shoot? Should I not? Do I want to chase this other guy? Do I not? I'm just make, 
not making any decisions until the last moment. I'm like, shit, if he takes any more steps, this opportunity is gone. So I decide I'm going to take this opportunity. So I draw back. He doesn't notice it. I'm like, perfect. So I'm thinking he's at 36 yards. Now, with my bow, because I shoot fairly heavy arrows, 20 to 30, not a big drop. But all of a sudden, from 30 to 40, there's a good size. It's not huge, but it's a good size drop. So uh, we're right in the middle of that. We're at 36 is what I'm guesstimating. I'm like, okay. So I'm going to take the 30 pin. I'm going to aim a little bit high, even though he's eating down. The problem is I knew better. What I should have done was called out and have him look at me. Um, or at least look away, wait for him to look away at the other direction. So he turns towards me, but he was looking down. He, like he was eating at the time. So I'm like, I'm going to aim at, at, I pull back, get sighted in, have the pin on slightly high, release the arrow. And as I release the arrow, he drops down. Cause what do deer do when they're eating? And same thing. If your reaction, you hear a loud noise, what do you do? You drop, you bend your knees and you drop down because you get ready to take off. Now, if he had been like up, you would have turned his head towards me to see where the sound was coming from. Instead, he dropped down and I just see the arrow go right over his back. Now, fortunately, I didn't wound him. There's that. But it just goes right over his back. I'm like, fuck, I don't think I got him. And he just takes off running. Damn it. Now. When I saw him where he was standing, it was 33. So I could have just put about 30 pin right where, right dead center, right behind the shoulder. And when he dropped, it would have been a double lung shot. Perfect. We would have been eating venison right now. But we're not uh, because of my indecision. Because instead of focusing on what really mattered, which was distance, I kept just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and waited till the very last moment. I had to make a quick, hasty, emotional decision rather than a logical decision. I had to make things, decide things in a rush rather than having the time where I could have been drawn back, taking my time, because I had plenty of time. If I had made this decision, of which felt like an eternity because the adrenaline's pumping, but if I had made this decision earlier on, this would have been no break, like easy shot. I practiced this shot all summer long so the fact that i miss was because i rushed it and didn't think logically i just like rushed it and reacted with emotion so missed him fortunately didn't injure him there's no blood on the arrow and i eventually found it in the dark i'm like where the fuck is this hair took me forever because i tried light and knock but made my arrow fly all wonky which that's a whole another discussion for you non-hunters of like arrow flight and all that shit like wow that is way more complicated than I ever expected when I first got into hunting uh, when you're shooting like high powered compound bows so moral of the story didn't see any other deer because he of course did the the call to be like dangerous here so it was everything else in the woods was spooked out didn't see anything else but lesson learned I'm like okay cool I'm gonna do I'll hunt next weekend again and then I probably won't do any more e- probably won't hunt for two weeks or so i don't want to burn my stand out but then I'll, I'll definitely morning hunt because i didn't burn out the morning hunts and i'll give it a little maybe a little bit of a break or go to a new location and hunt because i don't want to burn these stands out and you know not see shit for a while so moral story how this relates to you now that we're like half an hour in and finally told you the whole story Going back and forth with not making that decision. Should I? Should I not? Should I? Should I not? Should I? Should I not? And then all of a sudden making a very emotional decision is what a lot of people will do when they're trying to come up with a plan for weight loss or they're trying to think of the best workout plan or something like that. And instead of taking action and doing the right steps, you don't take any action at all, kind of like me waiting instead of being completely ready to go just kind of like waiting indecisively. And then at the very last minute, you're like, fuck it. You know, I'm going to do this $100 metabolism reset three-day thing and fuck it. 
this better work or, and it doesn't work. Just like me hastily making a decision. I like barely remember being drawn back. Like I fucked this up. I fucked up. Now I'm going to remember that for a long, long time, probably the rest of my life. Like I fucked up that, that should have been an easy fuck. He was just slightly quartering away, like basically broadside, like easy picture, perfect shot. That shouldn't have been a miss. It was a miss. Same thing. If you have all the time, make a decision and take action with whatever your health and fitness goals are. We don't want to make hasty, emotional decisions not based on any logic. We want to make logical decisions when it comes to our weight loss. And this is where like keto will go, should I, should I, should I, should I. I didn't work in the past, but I've, I've had a conversation with a couple of people who They've wanted to go back to keto. I want to go back to keto. Nothing else has ever worked faster at all, but all you measure progress with is scale weight. Unfortunately, this is where it's very hard for me to explain to someone, and hopefully if you're listening and you're one of these people, where scale weight doesn't mean fat loss. And ultimately, the goal is losing body fat, not losing scale weight. Because scale weight, does fat loss mean your scale weight's going to go down? Yes. But scale weight can be a thousand things. If you lop off your arm or your leg tomorrow, the scale weight goes down. If you're severely dehydrated, the scale weight goes down. If you sodium load and eat 10 grams of sodium, you're going to retain water like a motherfucker. That scale weight's going to go up. So it can be uh, manipulated in many different ways. That's what fighters do. Like, if you ever watch UFC, like, they do all this shit to get water weight off before they fight. Yeah, they're doing, they're manipulating the scale. So, same thing here, guys. Same thing. We can manipulate the scale for you with weight loss. And what keto does is with glycogen. Glycogen is stored carbohydrates. It's the annual version of starch. Think of it like that. So, if potato has starch in it, you have glycogen. That's how you store carbohydrates. And that's stored in your liver and your muscles. When you go keto and you're not eating really any carbs, guess what? You're going to burn through your carb stores. But every gram of carb that is stored, so you store one gram of carbohydrate, you store three grams of water. And that doesn't sound like too much. However, remember that a thousand grams is going to be two point two pounds and it's very easy to store a ton of carbohydrate in your muscles because it, it doesn't get used up unless you, you start to use it up well once you start using it up because you're not eating any carbs it's not being replaced all of a sudden it becomes depleted and as you burn that up your body uses that for energy it releases that three grams of water and now you're peeing out a ton you're like wow the scale is dropping super fast. And it's like, yeah, because you're dropping water weight. You're dropping stored weight. And this is also why the scale goes up when you eat a bunch of carbs is you're storing that as water. And that's the magic of keto. In the first, like, one to two weeks as you burn that, you're like, wow, I lost 10 pounds this week. Like, yeah, you did. You lost 10 pounds. You didn't lose 10 pounds of body fat, though. You maybe lost a pound or so, but... You didn't lose 10 pounds. Can tell you that. Nope. For the vast majority of people. Anyways, when you're going back and forth with creating that decision and then you decide, I'm going to do keto because it was the fastest thing ever that I've done. And even though I failed it time and time and again in the past, or I know people have failed it even though I haven't tried it, I'm going to do this thing. And you make this speedy emotional decision rather than thinking logically of, Hey, I can't keep this keto thing up for more than a couple months. Like, this sucks. Like, I can't enjoy the holidays. I can't do birthday parties. I can't go out to eat with my significant other ever. I can't do all these other things because keto is a lifestyle. You don't try keto. Because for you to truly be keto, you need to get into ketogenesis. Right? No, not keto. That is amazing. Do... Okay, I'm not fucking editing this. I'm not taking this out. Do not take this out of context. That is not a real thing. You need to get into ketosis. Ketosis is the real world. I do not want to see any clips of this online of me being like, I said ketogenesis. 
Um, that's not fucking real. Or maybe it's not. What, you need to get into ketosis. So to for your body to adapt to ketosis, it takes like two fucking weeks of 10 days, basically, to be in keto, fully ketogenic. It takes your body that long to adapt to it. So there's no trying it out. Like you have to fully commit and then you have to stick with it because it's very easy to get out of ketosis and then kind of have to reset the whole thing. So no, there's no, I remember early on, like someone's like, I was thinking about trying it. Like you don't fucking try keto. You either commit, you go all fucking in or you don't do it at all. Like it is not something that you can be like, I'm going to do that. Like you're not actually keto. Like, you're lo- you maybe are low carb, but you're not keto because you need to be in ketosis. You need to pee on a strip and be like, there's ketones. Now I'm in ke- uh, a keto diet. Like I'm in ketosis. And when my wife decided to try it, even though I didn't recommend it, she decided to try it. That's what we did. I was like, you need to get the test strips. We need to make sure that you are actually in ketosis or it's not truly keto. And even though not exactly what I recommend. She decided to try and then we did not stick. She did not stick with it long term because it sucks, especially if you're Italian like her and like pasta. And, and that's the thing when I've talked to people who have been successful long term with keto, it's very tricky to go out to eat someplace. You're limited in restaurants. I remember talking to someone like, I really like this certain restaurant around uh, where I live. And they're like, I don't like it there. Like, what do you mean you don't like it there? Uh, these other restaurants are similar to them, but why? Well, there's not really much on the menu that I can eat. Like, oh, different story. You're keto. So, yes, there's not much on the menu. That doesn't mean that the food, you don't like the food there. It's just because of your diet, you can't eat that food, even though it tastes fucking delicious. And that is the issue with keto long term, because if when you come off keto, what do you do? You eat more carbs. But the problem is you've built this habit of adding so much fat to all your meals because a true keto diet is like 70, at least 60, but more like 70 to 80 percent fat. So you're so used to adding all this fat. All of a sudden you come off of keto and now you're adding carbs. So now you're used to creating things with a lot of fat. And now you're adding a lot of carbs. Oh, that's a problem. That's basically pizza. It's like high carb, high fat food. Oh, yeah, that's a perfect recipe to regain body fat. And that's what most people do when they eventually come off. They're like, oh, I'm still putting heavy cream in my like coffee. But then I also eat these carbs. Like, huh? You're eating way too many calories. Because now all of a sudden your calories taste really good because you're adding carbs to fat. And that is the recipe, add a little salt or sugar to that, and all of a sudden, you can't stop eating. But that's creating that pro- that emotional decision-making. We don't want to do that. You want to create, be in a situation, not create, be in a situation where you can think about things, but you're not making it in decisions. And you can logically walk yourself through figuring out the approach you should take and then taking action on it. Like not just living in what, you know, I'm very guilty of just living it in research gather mode, like gather good research. There's always more information. There's more research studies. There's more blogs. There's more podcasts. There's more books, more, 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 more. It's like you never actually take fucking action. Just take some fucking action. And so <clears throat> that's kind of like me, like, just like, should I, should I not, should I, should I not, like, just throw the fucking bow back, be ready. And if you decide not to take a shot, don't take the fucking shot. That's what I should have done, but I didn't. And then I rushed it. It's the same thing. Just start taking action. Like, you're not doing anything. Maybe you should just start tracking what you're eating in general at all. I don't know what the perfect macro split is. Maybe just start tracking what you're eating right now. Well, how do I, how am I going to get this much protein in? Well, how much protein are you eating right now? I don't know. Maybe you should start by tracking what you're currently eating right now. And then you would know how much protein you're eating. I don't know how much I'm, how am I going to get that? Like I'm eating only 60 grams of protein. How am I going to get to 150? 
maybe you try to just add 10 grams per week for the next couple weeks till you get to 150 and that's how you get to 150 instead of trying to go from 60 to 150 and doubling your protein and take overnight that's very challenging actually it's more than double but it's very challenging to do that so you just want to take some sort of action instead of always information gathering the other thing is the one foot out the door which was also something i was dealing with like do I shoot the other book? Do I not? Like, I call this one foot out the door syndrome where I've talked to clients where I'm trying to get them through macros. Like, we're going over the, this is their appropriate approach for you. We should go with this approach. And they're like, yeah, but I heard fasting, but I heard keto. I don't truly believe I should have that many carbs or blah, blah. blah. I'm trying to work, but they kind of have one foot out the door. Like, I think that approach is best. And when that happens, you self-sabotage because you believe a different approach is the best for you, despite someone who's an expert telling you, no, that's not the case. We should go this route. And maybe that is the route to go in the future. But at this time, this is the appropriate approach for you. Instead of doing that, you create the self-fulfilling prophecy because you don't really go all in on the plan. So you're like, see, I told you it didn't work. He's like, yeah, because you put in 75% effort instead of 100. Hell, you don't even need to put 100% effort in. Put like 80, 90% effort. You'd put less than that in. Yeah, you're not going to see any results. 80% effort's like, okay, you're seeing results, but they're pretty slow. 90% of it's like, pretty good. If you're not doing that, you're not going to see fucking results. What do you expect? Create a self fulfilling prophecy. See, this doesn't work. I can't lose weight. Fuck that. You never actually committed 100%. So actually commit to the process. Don't have one foot out the door. But maybe you should try this other fucking thing. Fuck that. If you have a plan, commit to the plan. See if it fucking works. Just see. And it takes three weeks. You need to commit to for at least three weeks to see. And that's for a new, uh, like, changing of your nutrition. That's not a workout plan. You want to see if a workout plan works or not? Give it eight to 12 weeks. Eight to 12 weeks of being fully committed. If you're like, oh, I don't know if my workout plan is working. After two weeks, yeah, you're not going to know. It takes eight to 12 weeks to figure that the fuck out. So you need to actually commit 100%. If you're like, I don't know, I'm going to change up in two weeks. Like, fuck that. You're not going to see results. And that's where you're going to get stuck. And everyone goes through a period of time of program hopping, which is what this is called, where you're like, I'm going to try this, and then I'm going to try that, and then, oh, this came out, I'm going to switch my program to that, like, fuck that, commit, do a period of time, 8 to 12 weeks of going all in, same thing applies for your, when you're trying to lose fat, if you're going into a phase, and you're like, ah, oh, well, I want to, I want to lose weight, and for the next 12 weeks, it is a terrible time to lose weight, you have like, four travel dates, and a bunch of other things coming up, like maybe it's a terrible time for you to fully commit to fat loss. Maybe you should just like watch what you're eating and try to make healthy habit changes, work on other habits that might lead to you losing fat, but you're not going all in on fat loss. Save that for maybe the next 12 weeks where you can actually commit hundred percent because it's okay not to be fully committed to fat loss. It is okay not to do that. If you're like, my real goal is fat loss. It's okay to be like, you know what? I can't commit 100%, but I can commit to trying to make some changes during this time or maybe trying to build muscle or trying to improve my fitness so then maybe the 12 weeks after this, I can actually commit 100% to fat loss. And that is okay to do as well. Don't think like, oh, Chris is just saying like I have to lose weight, so I just need to like wipe out my schedule. No, fuck that. That's not realistic. We do need to actually commit to doing something. And that might just be working out. Like if you're not consistent with four days a week of working out and that's what your goal, maybe it's getting to that. Or maybe it's figuring out, hey, like I ha- I'm not going to the gym at all. Okay, great. Maybe we just commit to two, three days a week. We just start with getting to the gym, not tying it to fat loss or anything like that. We're just tying it to like, we're going to get to the gym. We're going to focus on getting stronger building endurance, whatever your goals are there in the gym. I'm not going to worry about the scale. We're just going to focus on building that habit. That's also okay. And you're taking action for in the future of going all in on the fat loss phase when that opens up. But for right now, you're just committing and taking action. And that's the moral of the story from my deer hunting story of like, don't be indecisive. Like, 
make it you you can go back and forth a little bit but make a decision stick with that decision and then don't make a hasty emotional decision make sure that whatever decision you do make is based in logic and it's well thought through not like i need to think about it and then you never fucking think about like no it's it's well thought through but you come to a decision quickly that will help you reach your goal so that's today's episode anyways um we have a guest coming next week so thank you guys for tuning in as always please leave a review um as that's always appreciated and check out the links down below we are running it's day two of the 10 day challenge with the lifts with alex facebook group so we're doing a mindset challenge make sure to go and join that if you want to participate it's free it's a very casual challenge it's just to help you with your mindset so if you jump in late it's okay if you can't do every single day it's okay it is to help you out it's totally free it's just in facebook so if you want to participate be there or if you just want to be a part of the group which is also appreciated 